Good evening. A warm welcome from Brussels to all of you in, on this late Saturday evening or afternoon, let me say, right in the middle of the two weeks COP26 uh, conference. I am uh, Ludo Dils, I am Professor Emeritus at Antwerp University and I am the Chair of the Advisory and Programming Group of the Public-Private Partnership Processes for Planet, one of the organizers of uh, this meeting. During the first week in um, the COP26 conference, we could listen to a lot of pledges and promises and at least I think that everybody agreed that really it's now time to act, there is no time to lose anymore. But what does it really mean? And that's really the topic of the discussion of uh, this late afternoon uh, discussion. In this one hour meeting, we will try to explain and discuss how process industry as producer of all the materials that we as consumers need is trying to reduce its emissions and emissions in the process industry are extremely high because we need a lot of thermal processes etc and we will see how um, the, in the same time the civil the civil society that is asking and even begging for plastics and uh, textiles that are recycled, reuse, sustainable, etc. How we can combine this? So how can we combine materials that on one hand fulfill the consumer needs and on the other hand how we can produce them in a more sustainable way? Uh, can I have the first slide please? Um, I will shortly present the the roadmap of processes for planet which is prepared by the 10 uh, industrial sectors of the process industry really large energy consuming uh, sectors and uh, as this event is co-organized uh, bet between or co-organization between processes for planet and planet tracker we will continue with two short pitches on plastics and textile this will be followed by a panel discussion with Planet Tracker on one hand and on the other hand with Margozio Rybak from CEPI and Janik Veik from Zero Waste Europe. And at the end we will have a lecture from Doris Schrucker of DGRTD of the European Commission. So allow me now to give you a few words about the uh, processes for Planet. In processes for Planet we are facing three kinds of problems. On one hand, I already mentioned it, we have a huge amount of CO2 emissions due to the processes that we use. On the other hand, in Europe we are facing more than 2,500 million tons of waste and this waste can become a kind of feedstock for the process industry to transform it into materials and to make this a secondary feedstock. And the third one is that, of course, in order to implement this, we must stay competitive. Otherwise, we will have no financial systems to support this. On the right hand side of this slide, I would like to, to mention you also that you see that uh, a lot of feedstock is coming in in the, the processes and producing then materials, but you also see that fully on the right hand side, a lot of emissions are coming out due to the high energy consumption but also emissions due to the incineration of waste and also a lot of waste is um, arriving finally in landfills leading as well to emissions and uh, in this week in, um, in Glasgow a lot of um, mentioning was done about the role of methane and exactly methane is one of these landfill emissions that is creating huge uh, problems. So just by avoiding waste we already can solve a lot of emission uh, problems. If we look to the process industry, we are using primary resources and transforming them into materials and then the manufacturing industry is using them to transform them into the products that we all as consumers use. And then later on, we uh, try to bring them into a recycling um, way and there we can see what is possible by doing a lot of different efforts. One of the efforts is that we can go uh, to new technology that we can 
track and trace these um, materials so that we better know how to handle them, how to manage them uh, for recycling. Second, of course, we need a lot of innovative technologies to improve this recycling to go to really an upcycling. Of course, in the process industry itself, increasing resource efficiency really makes sense and also re reusing the water that we use in all the processes is extremely uh, important. And finally, I also would like to say that the materials of the future need to be designed safe and sustainable in a way that we can really uh, recycle them in the future. Keeping the, all the flows as much as possible, uh, as long as possible, in a cyclic system is in fact the, the final goal of all this. And in order to do that, we really look forward to set more um, efforts into industrial symbiosis and we call this hubs for circularity. These hubs for circularity are bringing together different plants, different even urban situations, waste uh, plants, recycling systems, manufacturing systems, etc., all together where water, energy and materials are used from each other. So keeping it as long as possible in a similar flow, in a circular flow. And these hubs for circularity, we believe, will become the future uh, systems of production and of uh, industrial systems in the, uh, for, the, for the society. Finally, also, I already mentioned that the process industry is um, consuming a lot of energy because we have high energy intensive processes and in that way uh, we can try to replace as much as possible the electric energy by renewable electricity, the thermal energy we can replace it, which is mostly fossil now, by alternative fuels like hydrogen, but we can also use waste, biomass, and we can try to electrify our furnaces, boilers, kilns, etc. Of course, the industrial process itself can be electrified and efficiency is really the way forward to improve these uh, systems. At the end, we, use a lot of, we produce a lot of heat that is not used, and so the reuse of it, probably in other, by other factories, etc., really can reduce strongly our energy needs in total. And finally, if we still have some CO2 emissions, we try to convert them into useful minerals or chemicals or fuels. Nevertheless, we see that um, there is a huge need for materials in the future. And so this is really difficult if we are not moving towards recycling. And in that way, I think it's extremely important to see that the market share for the chemical industry, for instance, in Europe for green chemicals is very high, whereas the market share overall for chemistry is only 10%. We see that for green chemicals it is more than 30%. So there is really a huge market for it to do that. And in order to do that, we can focus really on the use of what we call circular carbon that is coming from the atmosphere, CO2, coming from the, the biosphere, biomass, and coming from the technosphere, which is the plastics. Of course, this must be combined with um, uh, sustainable energy in a way that we can do that with a fossil-free energy or at least a low-carbon energy system. And this brings us to the final uh, system where we are looking to really recycle everything. And recycling everything means that we have to minimize fossil feedstock and minimize the waste that is coming out. Also, I would like to say that we have technical cycles, but also biological cycles that really are already um, sustainable per definition. And if we combine them, we can really bring also biomass carbon into this recycling system. And finally, we can also bring CO2 into this uh, circular system and then m move more and more into a circular way in order to reduce fully the um, input of these new feedstocks and recycle as much as possible so that we can strongly decrease the use of materials but also the use of uh, different uh, new uh, feedstock chemicals. Having said that, I would like to, um, to move on towards um, the 
uh, discussion that we can start with our uh, second uh, partner, which is Planet Tracker. And in that way, I would like to invite John Wills as Director of Research at Planet Tracker. He has over 30 years of experience in the financial industry and worked in a variety of roles, including research, portfolio, management, and trading. And interestingly, he knows very well the, the buy side and the sell side. I would call it the demand and the supply side. And so, John, I will give you uh, the word to give a short pitch on plastics. You have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Professor. I hope there's not too much uh, background noise, but I'm ringing, I'm calling you from Glasgow and we do have demonstrations literally down the street. So uh, apologies for that. Um, next slide, if I may, please. And, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what I'd just like to do, I'm going to in under uh, five minutes, I'm just going to talk about plastics. Um, the professor has just spoken about a circular economy, but let me just be clear of, of the terms that we're using here. So the linear economy, we're talking about taking resources, making something, using it, and then throwing it away. In the circular economy, you stop that throwing away, and you keep reusing it. Unfortunately, plastics has one of the worst products called single-use plastics. The uh, clue is in the name, and that is perhaps one of the worst examples we have of the throwaway economy. But we have a problem. And next slide, please. The problem that we have is that we love plastics because they are a very, very good product. So they're versatile, they're durable, they're light, they're heat resistant, I could go on. And in fact, in some cases, our plastic companies would argue uh, with, with uh, some justification that, that they even have sustainable benefits. They are very light, but very strong. So they are used in transportation, and they can minimize uh, fuel consumption uh, uh, and things like that. However, they come at a very high cost. Next slide, please. And this is the cost that they come at. So if you look at the four steps, i.e. the taking, taking the resources, um, you well know the problem with fossil fuels and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. When we go to the making of these products, we then start to get in even more problems. We get into toxins, um, we get into pollution uh, problems as well. When we use it, we're disposing of these often in an unsatisfactory way. Uh, and that's just not on land, it's also in the oceans. And we have a very big disposal problem indeed. And the question is, whose problem is that? and the industry and uh, consumers have different views whose problem that is. So what options do we have? Could we have the next and final slide, please? The good news is that we do have options um, and some of them are not overly complicated. Can we prolong the use of plastics that we use? Can we recycle them? We just heard the previous speaker talking about recycling opportunities. What is the responsibility of the producer in all of these? And actually, perhaps the most simple, but the most um, uncomfortable for consumers is, can we simply use less plastics? So that is a very, very brief overview of the plastic industry. So I'd like to hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Kathleen Tubb, who uh, leads our uh, textile program at Planet Tracker and holds a doctorate in organic chemistry from Cambridge University. She joined us from a think tank called Rethink X, and she will now talk about textiles. Catherine, over to you. 
Hi everyone, nice to be here. Great. Can I have the next slide, please? Next. That's oh, great. So thanks, John. Um, circularity is definitely a big theme for textiles and a key part of the story for investors. And the textile supply chain is a far-reaching and pretty, in most areas, fairly opaque supply chain consisting of hundreds of independent companies in a complex network coordinated by textile orders from the brand owner or end retailer. And currently, in reality, this supply chain is pretty linear. And while circularity will certainly help mitigate some of the waste impacts for full circularity to be achieved, it needs to cover the whole supply chain, which has significant environmental impacts and therefore risks and opportunities for investors. And our aim is really to identify these through the lens of natural capital and communicate them to investors in the capital markets. And one key area we focus on is wet processing, which is one of the most environmentally intensive parts of the textile supply chain. And much of this is due to the energy and water intensive process of simply dyeing fabric. And we found that wet processing is a significantly under-researched part of the supply chain compared especially to things like raw materials production. It's highly dependent on fresh water and therefore there are significant water-related financial risks. And if these risks are to materialise, fresh water could become scarcer with the potential to restrict supplies to those wet processing companies, which could then manifest in terms of higher costs to businesses, either from increased regulation, higher insurance or even a higher cost of water itself. In addition, wet processing is predominantly done in regions of high water stress, which continues to put pressure on those wet processing companies already operating on thin financial margins and in turn increase the risk of losses for investors exposed to those companies through not only their active and passive investment portfolios, but also through direct investment and indirectly through their investments in the downstream fashion brands. Through our work, we identified 51 companies worth almost 30 billion US dollars, which have wet processing operations in regions ranked extremely high or high on WRI's water risk scale, which represents a significant financial risk to their investors. In addition to this, we found many of those public equities which hold those wet processing assets report little to no environmental data, which compounds the risk for investors. However, our most recent report has found that these wet processes offer opportunities for investors too. There are many easy environmental wins to improve the efficiency of wet processes, both through energy and water. The Apparel Impact Institute found an initial average investment of around $500,000 could lead to an equivalent operational savings in just 14 months, which is a phenomenally quick return on investment and comes also with a 10 to 15 percent energy and water efficiency savings. Next slide, please. We also wanted to highlight other areas where we're seeing moves in the capital markets as we move towards circularity. One area in particular has been the growth in sustainably linked debt finance in many sectors and textiles is no different. H&M, Chanel, Burberry, Adidas and VF Corp are just some of those companies utilising sustainability linked bonds to improve their environmental footprint. And there's a particular focus on reducing emissions from their supply chain, which is the biggest part of their emissions, scope three being about 90 percent. Next slide, please. And meanwhile, as circularity continues to be a big theme, that also offers specific options for investors. We see two key opportunities the post-consumer life of clothes and alternative materials. The resale market in particular has interest from investment investors and is expected to grow from around 7 billion US dollars to 36 in 2024. And this growth is being driven by technology platforms uh, such as eBay, Facebook, but also other apparel dedicated ones. And since 2015, we estimate almost 3.5 billion US dollars of public and private capital has been raised by those fashion focused resellers, and of which 2.5 billion has been since 2019. And brands themselves are also embracing that resale market, some by including resale as a service platforms on their own e-commerce sites. However, for the industry to become truly circular, it faces other challenges. Clothing needs to be made to last, and this is is an issue, especially in the fast fashion space, where there are often complaints about its durability. And while it prolongs the length of time clothes are in use from reselling, it does not solve the end of life problem, which remains a continuing challenge when seeking to achieve, achieve true circularity in the textile supply chain. Thank you. And back to you, Ludo. Thank you very much, um, John and Catherine, especially. 
Thank you for bringing this recycling of these plastics and the textile into a circularity, which is much more than just uh, collecting it and sorting it, etc. And Catherine, also many thanks for expanding it to the water issue, because uh, I think that indeed uh, for all the process industries, the use of water or the reduction or the recycling of water is extremely important. And finally, also the mentioning that these uh, competitiveness could be increased via a lot of reduction of costs really makes sense. Now I would like uh, to invite you all to um, a short panel discussion on accelerating the transition to climate neutrality and circularity. And before, let me introduce um, two other speakers. Janik Veek is the uh, Zero Waste Europe Climate, Energy and Air Pollution Program Coordinator and he leads on climate and energy policy advocacy work towards the EU institutions. And it's also my honor to present um, Malgozia Rybak as one of our board members. Malgozia is CEPI's Climate Change and Energy Director and she joined the team in January 2021 with almost 10 years of experience in public affairs and she, lets, uh, she leads sorry, CIPI's advocacy efforts on the climate and energy policy framework. This panel is about the dialogue of industry, capital markets and civil society. We have heard that we need huge investments, even trillions of euros, uh, to make the process industry climate neutral and uh, circular. Since uh, that investment, especially in process industry, only happens in cycles of 10, 15 to 20 years, we are really in the decade of action um, to get the right answers in due time. So in that way, I would like to ask a first question, especially to Malgozia, to Janik and to John, should we go for quick wins and uh, low-hanging fruit, or should we really stick to a plan of investments with the highest impact? Maybe first, Mangosia. That's a very good question. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who CEPI is, it stands for Confederation of European Paper Industries. And the reason why we were invited to this panel is because increasingly our sector is turning into bioeconomy. So on the one side, we're already producing pulp and paper and producing packaging. And all those of you who are maybe taking notes today, we probably the paper that you're writing all on already has fibers that were recycled four times this year. If not, they're going to be. Um, and then our sector is turning more into bioeconomy and more into biorefineries, and we're providing more substitutes for fossil-based products. And that goes from materials such as textiles, biomaterials, biochemicals. And to do that, as you said, a lot of investments are needed. And here what is important is on the one side to have the right legislation that provides the market for renewable recycled bio-based products and on the other side still supports recycling and still support make sure that there is separate collection and we have access to fibers that are of good quality. And then on the other side, next to the legislation, we also have industry. And we as an industry, as was said in the presentation before, we also have responsibility. And for this, we're together with SEPI and uh, producers and brand owners in our value chain, we work together to make sure that there is still untapped potential in the recycling and we wanted to tap into. With the 74% recycling rate, we're one of the world leaders in paper recycling, but we think we can achieve more. And I think that with this panel today, we're going to have to dive into what it means to uh, be more circular and what it means to become more climate neutral. So in that way, you, you mentioned really that you can go to alternative feedstock, which was mentioned also by Catherine strongly, and that not only this is uh, uh, interesting because it is bio, but that it also can be recycled. And of course, the paper industry is one of the big examples of this uh, recycling. Um, Yannick, may, maybe your answer okay. or suggestion. <clears throat> well, thank you. Yeah. Um, hope, hopefully, my, my voice is, is, is clear enough. Um, 
Um, yeah, I, I guess it depends on the on the sector. I just like to, uh, um, when it comes to we at Zero Waste Europe, we work on a lot on plastics, and uh, I don't think there are any shortcuts in there. Um, unfortunately, um, I think we need to go for the highest impact investments, um, and the current low hanging fruits um, simply are not good enough um, in terms of cutting the actual emissions to the level that are needed to, uh, to meet the 1.5 degree scenario. And uh, let, me, let me explain a bit. Um, so when we look at the current emissions uh, from the production of plastics, then these are clearly going up. Um, and if we continue the business as usual, uh, they're going to represent about uh, anywhere between 10 to 13 percent of uh, emissions of the uh, carbon budget left. And, and part of this um, is, is, of course, the massive uh, production of single-use items, but also items that um, are hard to recycle. So this is really driving the climate change. And when, when we are discussing the, you know, the options, then often what we see is that uh, the current focus is very much on uh, kind of end of, uh, end of life, of plastics, so it's been a uh, for the last decade. It's been on incineration, so a lot of plastics is simply burnt. And now the current focus and the discussion is really on on chemical recycling. And let me let me highlight here um, um, that by focusing on chemical recycling um, as a kind of low hanging fruit, it's it's not going to really work and address the climate issue. And the reason there. Um, is the fact that the emissions from chemical recycling, so-called reprocessing of plastics, in a, is a very, very high, uh, energy intensive. And if we compare it to the, um, for example, the, uh, the production of virgin plastics or even mechanical recycling, we are talking about 110% more emissions. So it's, we, we can't go for the, um, this as an uh, option. Um, particularly when, if you want to meet the, the, the climate demands. So I think the, when it comes to plastics, at least, um, um, we need to focus on reuse and, uh, and, and the actual recyclability of plastics. So, yeah. so you mentioned that there are several plastics difficult to recycle or even not recyclable. Yeah. Could this be solved by a lot of actions based on safe and uh, sustainable by design so that we only bring products on the market that have a recyclability? Um, absolutely, yes. I think the focus has to be um, on improving the actual recyclability instead of trying to find out how to manage the currently very hard to recycle plastics. Um, so that has to be the focus, but it's not going to be enough. Uh, we also need to move towards more reuse. Thanks a lot. John, can we have your opinion? Yes, I, I wouldn't disagree with what uh, Yannick has just said, but I would add that there are some quick wins and low-hanging fruit that can have a high impact. Now, they don't go across the whole spectrum, but I think that they are success stories. So for example, let's just take a very small area, uh, such as plastic bags. There was a charge put on plastic bags in a number of countries and consumption fell dramatically, often by over 80%. I would also say that sometimes when we're able to educate consumers a lot better, uh, product uh, demand uh, for those particular items falls dramatically. An example would be plastic straws. Now, I'm not saying that that is solving the plastics problem. Let me be very clear. But what I am saying that there were some very simple solutions and financially they were very easy to implement. I do recognize that to Thank you, John. It's a lot more complicated. We just uh, missed a few words of you, but uh, I think we can continue. So, John, you really mentioned that um, the legislation will certainly help. I would, and this brings me to the next uh, question. I think that not only legislation, but we also see now that consumers are more and more asking for products that have a high content of um, recycled 
polymers, etc. And so we see that the brand owners then bring these products on the market that they ask now to the process industry to provide them more recycled materials. Malgosia, how do you think we can accelerate this? Because I saw some weeks ago that the demand for recycled PET, for instance, was three times higher than the supply of it. How do you think that industry or process industry can uh, speed it up? So what we're doing in the pulp and paper industry, we talk, we could come together with the brand owners. So those that use the products and those that are going to manufacture the actual packaging, for example. And we bring our heads together to discuss what else can be done to improve the recycling rate. There is still some untapped potential when it comes to, for example, packaging, when it comes to packaging that was used in all of, uh, by uh, all of us in homes. And it's still, there are some challenges when it comes to technology and how to make sure that fiber are of high quality. So here, what is important is to have on the one side, the process industry to uh, understand how we can design packaging in a better way for recycling as well. And then also to understand better what the brand owner's expectations are and how clients use our products to better understand what is the best way to collect it and then to recycle it. Thanks a lot. I, I see that a lot of people is really asking now for new materials, is asking for climate uh, issues, etc. Um, John mentioned that there was a manifestation ongoing in Glasgow, the same time here in Brussels as well. And so um, we see on, on one hand this, uh, this tendency that public consumers, etc., really are looking forward to that. And on the other end, we all buy a lot of products that are not recycled, not based on that, etc. Yannick, do you have um, an idea how to explain this opposing view? On one end, we will all th that everything becomes circular. We want to be climate neutral, but we still continue to buy products as usual, if I can say. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I think there are, the, there are more and more. I think most of us actually, we really want to buy sustainable products. And uh, if you look at the polls um, on climate or pollution, plastic pollution issue, you can really see that most people care about it. Um, so we do want to, and we, we spend our time on, on looking for kind of more sustainable products. But um, of course, uh, you, it's difficult if your choices are limited or if you have no choices. So it's, uh, there is a very little you can do about it if you, are, if you don't have a choice. Uh, fortunately, the choices are going up, but the transition is, is, is a bit slower. And, and I think it's, it's to do with, with, with several, several factors. One of them uh, being that um, often uh, kind of singular items, they don't uh, carry the, the externalities, meaning that um, businesses who put, on, put out kind of reusable uh, alternatives, they, they, they don't have, the, they, 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 they are more costly and they don't have the advantage of uh, of using the resources over and over again, because single use is simply often a cheaper, cheaper option. There are also some other issues. Um, I think when it comes to sustainability in overall, then we are flooded over with all kinds of labels of what is sustainable. I think in Europe alone, we have 200 labels. So it's very difficult to choose and know what is really truly sustainable. I myself, I, must, I, I get confused when I go uh, and, and do my, my shopping, yeah? because I see so many labels, which one of them is actually truly organic and which one is maybe a fake, fake one. We know that out of 200, some of them are more or less transparent and some are not. And then again, there, there are other issues um, uh, such as greenwashing. And, and uh, there's a quite a lot of greenwashing, um, sometimes claiming, for example, I think um, the Planet Tracker was talking about uh, recycling of textiles. Um, as far as we know, it's, it's quite difficult to recycle textiles, uh, particularly when they are made of plastics. So, but despite uh, we, when we go and do our shopping, we see that the, the, you know, there are claims that this, these are being recycled. So I think here um, something you know, the Commission can do is to follow up on its green claims 
initiative and, and set a clear and transparent rules on what can be called as green. Thanks uh, a lot, Yannick. You mentioned these claims on one end that must be verified. And on the other end, you strongly mentioned the single-use uh, plastics. And this brings me again to, uh, to John, who was mentioning it already. And I think, John, um, you want to ban as much as possible these uh, single-use plastics. Do you think it's possible to ban them completely? Or should we, in certain cases, look for alternatives with other materials, etc.? I think, for instance, on biodegradable materials, uh, paper-based uh, systems, etc., um, in case that uh, otherwise we would create other, other problems because we cannot uh, conserve for a long time enough the, the, the food or whatever. It would be fantastic if we could ban these plastics overnight. Probably not realistic at the moment. Um, we are incredibly reliant on them, as we've said. Uh, take the medical industry. Uh, there would be a lot of problems if we hadn't been able to use or were not able to use plastics in the medical industry. Take surgical gloves, take face masks, etc. But having said all that, there is no reason why we shouldn't be used, looking for alternatives now. And Yannick sort of referred to this, that we need investors to force these companies to reallocate capital to look uh, for alternatives. And if they refuse to do it, regulators have to move in and force their hand. So if you take the United States at the moment, the CDC has just declared plastics are of strategic importance to the medical industry. I, I think they are, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be looking for alternatives. Thanks a lot, John. And I think indeed that plastics in medical applications will be maybe the last that we recycle, but um, uh, even there we have to move on. Um, this brings me to Catherine. Catherine, you mentioned strongly this uh, fast fashion and retailing, etc. How do you think that we can move forward now into this wet processing to do it in a better way from an environmental point of view, also from a, a climate point of view, and uh, not only looking to the water, but also uh, on this recycling? It was mentioned by Yannick that um, recycling of textile is very difficult. But the production is so huge worldwide that I think we have to, to, to go for it in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, they're two sides of the same coin. You can't just improve the environmental efficiency per item. But if you just sell more of them, it doesn't it has, ends up having a net zero effect. Right. So to really focus on the environmental improvement, really, we need to look at the whole supply chain or circle it as a whole. And, uh, you know, as Yannick mentioned, this comes really from the top down in terms of designing for circularity. And in addition, we need to really work on extending the life and durability of clothes through higher quality, uh, which really means that they're kind of more viable post-sale options through reselling, as mentioned. But recycling is vital. And that's where a lot of technology and investment is going into. Um, and that's also where new materials are probably going to be a game changer. You know, as I think we've alluded to here, but haven't specifically mentioned, 60% of textiles are actually plastic. So the same environmental impacts are relevant. And, you know, often we haven't even mentioned microfibers, which are a big kind of end of use problem specifically when it comes to textiles. And that's really exacerbated by that fast fashion, lower quality clothing. Um, and so that has a different environmental impact to just consumption of resources, say. So we just can't focus on one part of the supply chain. It definitely has to be the whole holistic approach. So this brings us to quality. So it's important to create quality and to give it a much longer lifetime. Maybe to Malgosia, a last question also. What about this competitiveness? How it is, is it possible that we can go forward now, that we do the big investments and still stay competitive? How do you see this? Do, do we need a kind of, of time system on which we can put different stage, stages? Or how do you see it? 
Uh, I'll go back to what I do on a daily basis, so it's policy. And when it comes to our sector, as you mentioned, Luda, at the very beginning, pulp and paper is one of the energy intensive industries. And for that reason, any legislation that changes the way that we price carbon, anything that impacts the price of energy, has a huge impact on the competitiveness of our industry. And when we look at what we do on a daily basis, so bio-based products, renewable products, recycled products, we as an industry, we have a good impact on the environment with the sustainable forest management and then the substitution effect of our products and materials. The part which still requires some work is the process part, the energy that we use. So here key is access to affordable renewable energy and then also to make sure that we are still protected from carbon leakage under the emission trading system. And I think what is important as well is to have this timeline and as you mentioned, this predictability that in allows us to make the investments. As an industry, on the average, we annually invest 5 billion euro into becoming more recyclable, circular and turning our mills into biorefineries. But to be able to do that, we need to have the predictability and we need to make sure that there is a market for our products. I see that uh, the biorefineries are moving up to 95% of, of use of, of all the biomass. But mm. what you are mentioning is that really at the level of the processes, there is still a lot of uh, actions that need to go on. And I think that's exactly why it is interesting to be in a cross-sectorial approach exactly. in processes for planet. Uh, we are coming to the end of, uh, of this uh, short uh, panel discussion. Of course, it's, it is much too short to have a, a full discussion, but um, we have some time constraints. But I'm also sure that you all have still some burning points that you want to say. So I allow you all to, to use a, an, an extra minute to give a last message that you want to, uh, to bring to the audience. And I start with you, Yannick. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, my message would be that uh, we need to move away from uh, end of life kind of solutions where we focus on trying to fix things once they, they become a waste. So a good example, again, uh, is a hard to recycle plastics or anything which is hard to recycle. It's, it's very difficult. So we don't need to, you know, now we are talking about, for example, chemical recycling, you know, molecular level recycling. I, I mean, do we really need that? Um, I would. Uh, I think the real potential for the change um, uh, is on the at the at the upstream, at the before the things become waste, and this is where we can really prevent the waste at source, and this is also where we can uh, reduce our our climate impact. So I think uh, um, that should be the focus. Thanks a lot, John. Do you have a last message? Yes, thank you. My, my last message is that with plastics, there's a certain irony. Plastics was originally developed to save nature. Um, prior to plastics, we were using things like corn, tortoise shell, and natural resins. So they developed these thin synthetic um, materials. The problem is the price of using those, the present ones that we have, these uh, synthetic materials, the price is too high. In fact, it's probably one of the worst in terms of industry. It's not just carbon emissions. It's not just toxins. It's um, litter, it's pollution. It's not just land, it's not just air, it's oceans as well. And the price is too high. So we have to reallocate capital to find alternatives. Thanks, John. Um, Malgosia, your last message? That I think that in this whole process, partnerships such as Processes for Planet are very important. We mentioned already that uh, there are some industries that face the same challenge as the pulp and paper industry to improve their processes, to use less energy or to switch to renewable energy. And here, funding and working together with the Commission is of key importance because, for instance, for our industry, uh, energy efficiency and making sure that we're using less energy and we're making sure that we can produce, for example, on-site renewable energy from waste and residues is 
very important. And we know that there are other industries that are facing the same challenges and we can do it together, which is enabled also by EU funding. And here, I think that the last thing that is worth reminding ourselves of is it's, there are two parts. So far, first is the what we use, the materials that we use for our products, but also how they are produced. And I think that that was very visible in the conversation that we had today. Thanks a lot. And maybe also how they are consumed and then after uh, end of life, etc. Maybe very short, Catherine, if you have a burning message you want to mention. Sure, um, so I mean, overall textiles are definitely undergoing transition, but there's definitely a balance between investing in newer technologies, which are perhaps more environmentally efficient, and enabling investing where we can in the existing processes to just make them more efficient in that transition period. Thanks a lot, Catherine, for being very short in time and, uh, and so on. So um, now it's, um, I thank the whole panel for the very nice discussion, and now I would like to move to an expert in our uh, program, and this is a very short presentation by uh, Doris Schrucker, who is head of the unit of DG Research and Innovation, Prosperity, and I invite her to give a closing keynote um, focusing on how the European Commission wants to accelerate all the processes that we were just discussing here during this uh, three-quarter an hour discussion already. Doris, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Ludo. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. It was uh, very interesting. You addressed a lot of challenges, low-hanging fruits versus more massive challenges in the process industries. Um, I would like to give you the perspective of EU public support for the innovation and the quite fundamental transformations which we see ahead for the industry and the investments to make. Um, we know that this needs to be more and also different from the business as usual investments. You mentioned that you are investing in research already. And uh, this is why research and innovation are so important. And I'm working at DG Research and Innovation. Uh, the EU framework program, um, Horizon Europe for Research and Innovation, is one of the largest EU support programs, and it has a budget of more than 95 billion euros over seven years, of which 30%, just to mention that, are dedicated to climate issues. And in this process, the support uh, of climate-related goals through missions and partnerships with the industry, such as Processes for Planet or Clean Steel, uh, Circular Bio-Based Europe, Hydrogen, Batteries, a human-built environment for construction and others is central and is important. And partnerships with industry are a key building block to accelerate the developments. The Commission has launched already with the industry 11 partnerships uh, for a total investment of 22 billion euros until 2027 and Horizon Europe will support them with 8 billion. So you see the leverage effect which we want to achieve as well with, the, with our input. And further 10 partnerships with industry will be launched with an investment of 20 billion euros. Um, also here half of it comes from Horizon Europe, half comes from the industrial partners. We are glad to say that most of them target directly emission reductions and the transformation to a circular economy in their areas. And they are set up for us very important to achieve tangible results and the impact. So if I take processes for planet, for example, this concerns the process industries, industries which contribute about 20% of climate emissions. And we address the complex challenges to improve better industrial processes, to capture and reuse CO2, and as you discussed, also how to make plastics or metals other, or other components which go into products circular and sustainable. Um, we try to establish projects which bring the circular economy and the carbon neutrality together and prove that it is possible, for example, in circularity hubs, which connect industries with each other in symbiosis, uh, but also, for example, for, with, with the cities. Overall, it is important for us that the goals are in line with supporting the Green Deal goals and um, important investments will go into, into large-scale uh, demonstrators as well. If we look at textiles, we are not only looking at clothing, but also the automotive market or medtech are important markets. 
and uh, R&I research innovation can support industry to develop and use a life cycle approach, which covers also other actors and the value chain beyond individual companies. This concerns the carbon footprint as well as sustainable design of materials in the circular economy. You mentioned already safe and sustainable uh, by design, which concerns virgin materials and how to integrate circularity and, uh, and circular technologies. Um, if we aim at tangible impact from the partnerships, we would like to see that the results are translated and taken further into business investments. And we need to be faster than usual. Uh, therefore, it is important that we go for low hanging fruits and through R&I to tackle the bigger challenges, such as the energy consumption for chemical recycling of plastics, as you mentioned. In order to support that, we are establishing links and synergies with a number of different EU instruments which support industry and investments, which are geared towards the priorities of the green transitions and the goals of the European Green Deal. At European level, I can mention the Innovation Fund, which uses the revenues from the EU emission trading system, Invest EU, managed by the European Investment Bank and the Innovation and the European Investment Fund, the regional funds, the Trust, Trust Transition Fund, and the use of the Next Generation EU Fund in the Member States Recovery and Resilience Plans, where we see plans for about 200 billion euros in addition to previous planning for the green transition and to accelerate uh, developments. Industry expects support from the public for research, innovation and transformation, which involves risks and uncertainties. Vice versa, we need the commitments from the industry for action with the needed impact. Public investments are not enough. And uh, in order to achieve the climate and energy goals of the European Green Deal, the Commission, for example, estimated that we have an investment gap of around 260 billion euros each year, which needs to be tackled by both public and private actors. And just to mention also the partnership, we invest 1.3 billion from Horizon Europe into processes for planet and we expect that the industry matches that with own investments and also then for the scale up. To trigger sustainable investments, this is why the EU has developed the sustainable finance policy and uh, the aim is to channel investments and to also show what is sustainable by in, uh, in implementing the sustainable finance taxonomy, which sets here the frame. And the challenge of staying within the boundaries of our planet is not only about money, it is also what happens with the money. So we develop strategies such as the common industrial technology roadmaps, which we are now developing for low carbon technologies for energy intensive industries and one on circular industrial technologies, where we look at energy intensive industries, constructions and textile as uh, quite affected uh, sectors. And we build on the strategic research and innovation agendas of the partnerships. We reach out to the member states and we examine together the investment agendas and prioritization needs to help create investment pipelines for these new needed technologies and which should be supported from different public and private sources from early stage developments that to deployment. We need to link that better than previously. So in total, urgent action is needed. We put in place the instruments, investing big and now in the next years is essential for the climate, for the circular economy, but also if we want to stay ahead. If Europe is very good in science, we need now to make sure that we also translate that into the economy. And let's not forget that the rhythm of acting needs to be rapidly increased and public and private are called to ensure their part. Finally, this is about people. You mentioned that they are on the streets and our responsibility to change. Change comes always at the cost, but in this case, even business as usual will cost even more and dear. So better to use the moment, the resources which we have, make the best of them, use the opportunity to collaborate, to get the systemic changes to which we need and do it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Doris, for these uh, nice words. And you really mentioned that all the instruments are available at the moment, so we need to use it. And it's very clear that we need to use them in a public-private combination. No one of the two can realize the, the very strong uh, ambitions. So that was very clear. What you also mentioned was these first-of-a-kind uh, plans that we need to create really impact and indeed we have to go to very big very strong investments uh, where we really show to the world that we can make the difference and that we can create this impact and again there of course we need all these different uh, investment funds these different uh, tools that were created um, by the commission in order to realize this uh, in uh, due time and of course in the meantime a lot of research and development in this decade of action is needed and in that way the uh, public-private partnerships as processes for planet, but you mentioned several other ones. And by the way, these are all the different uh, public-private partnerships with, with whom uh, P4 Planet is strongly collaborating in order to um, accelerate and to um, multiply our efforts in a very strong way. Many thanks for that. So this brings us more or less to the end of this uh, panel discussion. I would like to thank the speakers and the panelists for their nice contributions. And we'll try to wrap up a little bit uh, what we discussed uh, this afternoon. So we saw that uh, civil society drives really brand owners, manufacturing industries, etc., to move more to sustainable products. So this means that process industry who is making the materials must really follow this and must accelerate to bring materials on the market that are produced with recycled feedstock, with more sustainable feedstock and with um, uh, processes that were less energy intensive. We discussed a lot at the level of plastics and textile, where we see that the reduction of primary resources must go on in order to go to, on one end, longer lifetimes for these uh, materials, and on the other end, to replace uh, them by secondary feedstock so that we can really recycle them. And recycling means really going to circularity, not just downcycling, but really upcycling that we can even make from the old plastics the new materials of the future. We discussed also the, the bio aspect, if I can say, via, bio, uh, via cellulose-based materials, etc., that, uh, that are in, inherent, uh, already uh, climate neutral due to the circularity, but that can become a sink for carbon if we recycle them in a continuous way. So in that way, they can help at least to replace some of these uh, uh, single-use plastics in a better way so that we can move on there where it is necessary to really to use plastics in a certain uh, case. Uh, we also saw that the circular um, uh, economy contributes strongly to the greenhouse gas re emission reduction as well because we need less extraction of primary materials but also we have less incineration, we have less landfill, avoiding uh, methane which is one of the uh, low hanging fruits that was at least mentioned this week at the COP in uh, Glasgow. And uh, finally I would like to say that the Commission strongly mentioned also that this R&D under uh, Horizon Europe in collaboration between public and private is extremely uh, important and that this will help us to reach really the ambitions of becoming fully climate neutral by 2050 and also circular by 2050 and it means also that in this decade of action we need to fully develop all the technologies to allow us that from uh, uh, 2030 on we can really move to uh, install, to deploy, to implement the full plants in uh, Europe and in that way we are strongly looking forward of course to inform you in the coming years about a lot of uh, new first-of-a-kind plants and by the way in um, processes for planet, we call, call them our marbles. And with these marbles, I would like to uh, end this uh, uh, panel discussion and to end this uh, uh, event uh, on process industry. And I would like to wish you all a very waste-free 
and nice um, Saturday evening uh, everywhere in Europe and worldwide. Thanks a lot and see you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you.